Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to come today. It's a fantastic place. Um, I wish we had more conference venues like this in Manchester. Um, I wasn't quite sure how broad to cast the net of talking about critical post-humanism and theological anthropology. So if I'm repeating things that you already know, I apologize in advance for that. Um, to give you a roadmap of what I want to do for the next 45 minutes or so, I'll start off by looking at some of the ins and outs of post-humanist theory, some of the different figures in post-humanism. I know you've all come across the transhuman um, through various talks at the, uh, this week. Uh, but I'll try and focus on what critical posthumanism is in distinction from those and some of the similarities and nuances of how we can think about critical posthumanism. And from there, I'll then suggest some sort of avenues for theological engagement with it, particularly from my own research um, on um, cyborgs and theological anthropology. So I'll talk about, uh, about how they, they go together. Um, I do sort of have a tendency to talk quite fast as well. So if I am talking too fast, please just wave at me and I'll slow down. Um, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> point taken. Um, okay, so, and also if there's anything. <laughs> I'm full of caffeine now, so. No, 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 um, so I'll start off by looking at uh, different theories of posthumanism and then go through some of the theological stuff afterwards. So posthumanism is a complex term, uh, partly because the idea of the posthuman um, has sort of different layers. You can use the term posthumanism to refer to the broad notion of posthumanism, whatever that is, and there's also specific subsets of posthumanism that look at certain figures, including the posthuman as well. So if it sounds confusing, believe me it is, I'll try and break that down a little bit for you. So one of the key figures within the broader kind of uh, catch-all term of posthumanism uh, is the idea of the transhuman, and transhumanism can be classified as a subset of the broader notion of posthumanism. Um, the way that I kind of see transhumanism or try to break it down in my own work is um, this notion of uh, human enhancement. So uh, the UK sort of transhumanist society fairly recently uh, rebranded themselves and their website is now Humanity Plus. And I think that quite neatly encapsulates what the transhuman is all about. It goes back to Julian Huxley's term where he first coined the term transhumanism in his book New Bottles for New Wine. And he describes transhumanism as man remaining man, horrendously gendered, but we'll just put that aside for now. Uh, man remaining man, but realizing new possibilities of and for for his human nature. So there's this continuity of the human subject uh, as well as kind of changes and overcoming the kind of constraints of the human condition as well. So there's continuities and also discontinuities and that's what this idea of the transhuman is getting across. So the image here is of cybernetic enhancements. That's one of the ways that we can break down an understanding of the transhuman. It's this kind of point about enhancement going beyond the norm but still being you at the same time and that's the fundamental continuity there. It gets slightly more confusing there because part, some, uh, some transhumanists will talk about a goal to become post-human. And this is where we think about post-humanism as a subset of the broader notion of post-humanism or post-humanist studies. Where it's post-humanism is linked to the idea of the transhuman or to transhumanism, it's this idea of kind of becoming an other or making an other. So in some critiques of transhumanism, uh, there, are, there are people that say, if you keep me making these incremental changes to yourself, how do you know that you are still you in spite of all these changes? And if at some point you cease to become you in any meaningful way, you might then be said to become post-human and you've crossed what Elaine Graham terms the gates of difference. Um, there's, a, there's a watershed there become, from being uh, at a kind of continuity with the, with the human subject to being more of a discontinuity. And when we cross that gate of difference, the emphasis is placed more so on otherness. And this is kind of the stuff of sci-fi as well, when those kind of technological changes reach a point where we are no longer recognisably human or recognisably ourselves. In this formulation, the post-human is the kind of teleology of uh, a transhumanist kind of uh, sentiment or a kind of uh, the goal of transhumanism is to become uh, somehow post-human. So uh, there are various essays in the Transhumanist Reader, um, edited by Max Moore and Natasha Vitamore, where they talk about uh, the kind of uh, the dream or the vision of our post-human future. They want to make transhumanist changes to the selves so that we somehow someday become post-human. And these kind of ideas can be sort of linked to uh, the notion of the singularity. The singularity is uh, what Ray Kurzweil discusses, the point where machines become conscious, where they become spiritual. There's a kind of axial point here where we're crossing a gate of difference 
difference and ourselves and the world as we know it is radically different. And this is where we cross from uh, a transhumanist kind of present that we have to a post-humanist future beyond the singularity. There are vague uh, points, there are different sort of uh, arguments about which point we can, point, we can locate this gate of difference. Uh, if you're continuously making incremental changes, for example, to the self, how do you know at what point you cease to become human? Where do we place that marker? So what this kind of transhuman, post-human sort of interaction raises is the question of what does it mean to be human? What are the limits of, becoming, of, of being human? And where do we cease to be human, if at all? Um, can we always be human by adding more and more technologies slowly to ourselves or do we have this identifiable point where we cease to become human and we cross this boundary into post-humanism? Um, if anyone's not see I've got some images here to help embellish, embellish some of the points I'm making. This image is taken from uh, a fairly recent film, Trans uh, Transcendence, which features Johnny Depp. If you've not seen it, I wouldn't recommend watching it. It's not fantastic, um, but it does highlight some of these ideas about transhumanism. Uh, this uh, central character, Johnny Depp, uh, ends up being uploaded to cyberspace and he somehow becomes uh, very kind of non-human in, in an identifiable sense. There's a rupture with who he is and he becomes quite post-human. So it's a film that expresses these kind of uh, boundaries and ideas. Although, to, to disclaim, don't, don't go out and watch it. Um, alongside these kind of changes that technologies can make to the human, we can also link uh, post-humanism with changes that we make to other species as well. Uh, and this is something I know that Celia has written about in some of her work, the idea of the post-animal. Um, when we're using technologies to interact or intervene in the genetic codes of uh, different species, when we're trying to upgrade different species, trying to use technologies in different ways, we're kind of changing what that species is in any kind of natural or given way, um, and therefore it kind of falls under this rubric of post-humanism as well. It's these kind of changes and interventions made through technologies that involve the human in some way. Does anyone recognize this green rabbit? A few nods. So if anyone's not familiar with it, it's a piece of bio art by Eduardo Kack, um, and this is a kind of live art installation where Kack uh, injected uh, cells from, I think it's phosphorescent uh, kind of uh, life forms into a rabbit and it was this, it had this luminescent kind of glow then and it's a real living being but it's also uh, a sort of post-humanist installation of the possibilities of using technologies, outworking human capabilities in our relationships with other animals as well. Kack's a really interesting figure, not only for thinking about post-humanism but also thinking about post-humanism and theology. So I'm going to suggest a brief inroad to theological explorations here through Kack's work. One of Kack's pieces that he's, uh, he's, he's worked on is this uh, idea, this, this, uh, this installation called Genesis. What Kack did with Genesis is he translated a certain line from the biblical book of Genesis, uh, let man have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Kack translated that into Morse code using a sort of um, an algorithm or kind of a translation tool that he developed himself. He chose Morse code because it represents the information age. It represents kind of how we, mass communication began to spread. And then through its conversion into Morse code, he translated it into a, G, into a DNA sequence that he put into uh, living bacteria cells. And these bacteria cells are in this um, installation uh, as part of the project. Um, and what would happen, so you can see on the, on the screen here, there's the DNA sequence uh, that's a sort of translation of the Genesis uh, lines. As audiences walk around the space, they can click a UV light and it changes uh, or it causes mutations in the bacteria, so it causes the DNA to change. And at the end of the installation, CAC translated that code back into uh, Morse code and then back into a kind of English uh, script. And the whole point that he was trying to make there is our interactions with these ideas through technologies changes how we're engaging with that text as well. So he's suggesting that it was a kind of uh, re-envisioning of certain theological ideas, certain inherited ideas that we, we culturally uh, take on board. There's a kind of a hermeneutic kind of changing of that there. Um, so this is one way of thinking about post-humanism and theology there. Complexifying the notion of post-humanism yet further, there's changes we can make to the human, there's changes we can make to animals, and there's also changes we can make to a new species of itself. And this is, again, another sci-fi uh, popular fodder, this idea of the robot. Uh, whether or not we want to say it's a species, whether or not we want to say it's alive, there's this um, idea that somehow robots link 
to ideas of post-humanism because it is a sort of technological being. Um, and there's discussions at the moment about whether robots have sentience, whether robots have consciousness. These all fall under the rubric of post-humanism because, as I'll say shortly, we're making these robots kind of in our image and it's linking to the sort of human of post-humanism. But I'll come back to that afterwards. So just to give you a sort of overview of different ideas of post-humanism here, we've got changes to the human, changes to other species, and technological species as a kind of third category as well. Post-humanism as a broad term can accommodate for all of these, and it also has these links with transhumanism as well as a sort of specific figure. In all of these visions of post-humanism, I don't know why they're moving like that. Uh, in all these visions of post-humanism, we have this kind of split between technophobia on the one hand uh, and what I'll say afterwards is technophilia. So with technophobia, because of these changes that we're making to the world, these radical changes that we're making with technologies, there are different arguments that people have made in response to these. People like Francis Fukuyama in his book, Our Post-Human Future, worries that our essential humanness is at stake. He thinks that we're going to lose something about ourselves, about what it is to be human, without even realizing what we've lost until it's too late. So he sees this kind of incremental change to the human as problematic in that we will someday cross that gate of difference and no longer be human in a recognizable way. We'll kind of keep being, we'll keep making these transhumanist changes to ourselves and become post-human without realizing what we've lost about our humanness at the same time. So he's quite sort of bioconservative in that regard, but this is one kind of aspect of technophobia that comes from post-humanism. Other people like Nick Bostrom uh, and other leading scientists and philosophers have talked about the concern about existential risk. There's a more concrete risk to our own existence and our own kind of uh, flourishing as a species that is posed by these technologies. So it's less of a kind of, uh, it's less of a kind of um, an ontological risk. What is it to be human? It's more about our survival and flourishing as a species that these technologies uh, might bring about. So there's various forms of technophobia located in that. There's also more sort of theological, more kind of uh, myth uh, mythological forms of uh, technophobia that manifest from these technologies and from post-humanism in the sense of mystery. Uh, we, and it kind of links this point about existential risk. We don't know what consequences some of these technologies might have on the world, might have on what it is to be human, might have on our interactions with other species. And because these consequences might be very far-ranging, there's a sense of the kind of, uh, there's a sense of, uh, sort of dread or peril uh, that's locked into these technologies. Uh, interestingly, with the point about mystery, there's also sense for something a bit more kind of, a bit less sort of bleak encapsulated in these kind of notions of what um, Otto says about the tremendum and the mysterious. There's um, more open kind of ways of thinking about it, but when it comes to technophobia, this sense of mystery gives us a sense of dread that we're more familiar with, especially perpetuated through things like sci-fi, through media headlines about the dangers and the worries uh, posed by new technologies. And a lot of these kind of, uh, specifically, uh, specifically in sci-fi, a lot of these ideas can be traced back um, through mythological texts, but in particular in the Western tradition through Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein novel where she talks about the, limage, the limits sorry, of knowledge and control um, that humans can have over another species. So it's questioning our relationships with technology uh, and what our capabilities and what we can and should be doing with these technologies. So there's various forms of technophobia that come through in these narratives. And Frankenstein's an interesting one because uh, linking with this point about existential risk and mystery, uh, the newspaper headlines like calling things, you know, Franken foods, Frankensteinian kind of, you know, new things that we're making. They have this kind of uh, issue about what, what we can and should be doing in the limits of our knowledge and control. What's interesting about these kind of uh, post-humanist ideas that I've been looking at so far, so the transhuman, the post-human, the there's the teleology of the transhuman, the kind of bioengineering of animals and the creation of robots, also has elements of technophilia in it. And this is something that I'm researching uh, or coming to the end of researching at the moment. Um, this idea that we're romanticizing machines as much as we're kind of fearing them. So when we're making these technologies, we have this kind of, this ideal fantasy of becoming one with a machine, which is what Mark Cockleberg talks about, the sort of disappearance of the machine, and we become a sort of union with it. Um, we take on, the, the machine takes on sort of romanticized and even spiritual meanings, which re-envisions uh, what it is to be a machine or what we think about technology in the first place. But all of these kind of technophobic and technophilic sentiments can be related back to these kind of transhumanist ideas, uh, these ideas about uh, building a post, the, the post-animal, changing animals. There's these sort of narratives of progress and doing things for the better that link to these kind of uh, ideals of technophilia as well. <laughs> 
Uh, as I say, these are things that I'm looking at at the moment. This is the name of my current postdoctoral research project, uh, which has uh, various kind of things coming out soon, including an editor collection that I'm working on at the moment, uh, which is looking at different aspects of love and technology and theological, um, into theological discussions. Um, that's just a side note there. But there are these kind of tendencies towards technophobia and technophilia that are, that are important to be aware of, and they seem to go hand in hand with some of these transhumanist uh, and certain visions of the post-human as well. Beyond all that, and this is where it gets even more complex now, that's all a kind of what I would term an S, a sense of evolutionary post-human, because there's a sort of trajectory that we're making with our technologies in the direction of progress. So with the transhuman, we're looking at incremental changes to the human. With the post-human, that's the result of these, uh, these changes. That's the sort of future teleological point that we can envision for ourselves for the better or for the worse. Uh, when we're making changes to animals, there's a narrative of progress, there's a narrative of linear kind of um, evolution that's embedded in these. And with robots as well, a lot of sci-fi in particular talks about robots or worries about robots as a successor species to our own. Um, are we going to be sort of wiped out by robots in the near future? These are all kind of evolutionary forms of the post-human, and they contrast or slightly contrast uh, against the more critical strands of post-humanism which are more invested in interrogating what it is to be human by scrutinizing boundaries. I don't want to kind of overemphasize this distinction because, of course, with the evolutionary post-human, we will have those moments where we're asking what it is to be human. We are scrutinizing boundaries. What's happening with critical post-humanism, though, is there's less of a sort of uh, notion of progress or there's less of an investment in ideas of progress that are going alongside these changes. Um, and so post-human is kind of more of a reflexive, um, almost circular looking back on what it is to be human, not just through our technologies, but also through our other attachments as well. One of the seminal texts for this form of critical post-humanism, which is ironic because um, this sort of uh, author wouldn't even regard themselves as a post-humanist anymore, uh, but Donna Haraway in 1985 wrote the Cyborg Manifesto, which interrogates what it is to be human. She says, basically, we're not humans in any meaningful way because we have no uh, idea or no real tangible idea about what it is to be human. And she offers the cyborg um, as a sort of alternative figure that we can think through our attachments with technologies, with the earth, with other animals as well. Um, and these are things that um, Lynn Randolph, in her image of, Cyber of Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto, which is the image here, uh, these are things that Lynn Randolph has captured of Haraway's work. So you can see the sort of feminist critique that comes through of Haraway's um, reinterpretation of the cyborg figure. You can also see the attachment with the earth. You've got the space in the background. Um, you've got all these kind of coming together of mythological and scientific ideas. And this is what Haraway's trying to do with the cyborg manifesto, is really kind of challenge those boundaries that are at the heart of a lot of the things that we're doing in our culture, especially things leading towards evolutionary transhumans and so forth. I say it's ironic that we call, or that I would at least call Haraway a critical posthumanist. In her latest work, Staying with the Trouble, she rejects the term posthumanities uh, and she prefers the term posthumusities. Uh, so she says we're humus, not human. She does some interesting things with, uh, with language there, but I think as this kind of interrogation of what it is to be human in the first place, it's quite interesting how these terms all kind of come together. The critical post-human is often misunderstood or conflated with other forms of the post-human, and this is where things get really confusing. The cyborg in particular um, is often associated with transhumanist ideas. Um, so the first mention of the cyborg was from 1960. Uh, it was a paper called uh, Cyborgs in Space, written by Manfred Kleins and Nathan Klein. They wanted to propose a way to use technologies to um, allow humans, or specifically men in their paper, uh, to go out and explore space. They talk about uh, having technologies that regulate our bodily functioning, going into the body to regulate our functions, allowing our minds to explore, to think, to feel. So there's these kind of dualistic ideas that are all about the kind of expansion of the human in some way. Because that's the first idea of the cyborg we get, and we've since had uh, a lot of um, emphasis on, this, on the Terminator in particular in, in popular culture, it's easy to think or to associate the cyborg with this form of uh, human enhancement, 
uh, whereas in actual fact it has a, um, a strong link with critical post-humanism as well, thinking about what it is to be human in the first place in light of all these different boundaries. So this is why I say there is a distinction, there is a, uh, a tension between critical and evolutionary post-humanism that's worth bearing in mind and being aware of, but at the same time they do interact quite a lot with each other and it's not a hard and fast distinction that should be absolutely clung to with, with absolute rigidity in keeping with the whole spirit of challenging boundaries in post-humanism. So there are no clear boundaries between uh, critical post-humanism and evolutionary post-humanism. One of them has, uh, is more invested in notions of progress and uh, uh, evolutionary teleological trajectory, and one of them is more about thinking about who, who we are in the here and now, and that's very much what uh, Haraway kind of inspires in her cyborg work, which has influenced a lot of subsequent uh, critical post-humanist theory. There is a critique, an important critique, I think, that has been made of critical post-humanism. Uh, Michael Hauskeller is a philosopher, and he's written a lot of things on transhumanism, uh, critiquing transhumanist ideas. Um, he's written a lot of uh, books and articles on this kind of thing. One of his more recent books is called uh, Mythologies of Transhumanism, and it's a really good read. Um, one of the things that Hauskeller points out in this is that in actual fact, you know, his, his critique of transhumanism is transhumanism is all about trying to liberate ourselves from the shackles of the human condition. So some transhumanists might say that the body is our kind of meat shell and we'd be far happier uploading ourselves to cyberspace and being without our bodies. That's kind of Hans Moravec's vision of a sort of robot surgery that will uh, allow us to be more, more human in cyberspace without our bodies. So there's a kind of clear sense of liberation, whether you agree with it or not, and I definitely don't, but there's a clear sort of liberation narrative that's embedded in these transhumanist ideas. It's quite Gnostic in a sense. What Hauskeller says, though, is that even these critical posthumanist ideas seek a similar kind of emancipation and liberation. The emancipation that critical posthumanists are trying to work against are the problematic dualisms and binaries that are sort of uh, infiltrating or saturating our culture. So Haraway in the Cyborg Manifesto gives us a long list of binaries, uh, speaking of uh, the gender binary, uh, the sort of uh, the human technology binary, the human animal binary, loads of different sort of binaries that, that cloud our, our worldview in linking to things like dualism as well, body and spirit. Hauskeller identifies a form of uh, emancipatory idealism in these critical post-humanist ideas. And I think this is an interesting critique that draws together uh, critical post-humanism and evolutionary post-humanism even closer. So they kind of riff off one another anyway, but with this kind of liberationary ideal, they're still kind of doing similar things as one another, albeit I think in quite different and significantly different ways. So I'm going to give you a couple of different uh, key thinkers in critical post-humanism now. I'll do a really uh, sketchy outline of what they're all saying about um, critical post-humanism, and that's um, something I encourage you all to look at in, in more detail. These are all great books that I uh, have actually enjoyed reading, not just for research. Um, Rosie Bredotti is a uh, continental European philosopher, uh, and she has written a really good book, nicely just titled The Post-Human. Uh, and in that book, Bredotti carries on the sort of feminist angle of the critical post-humanist sort of tradition, which is kind of, you know, taking up um, Haraway's sort of uh, points. Uh, and Bredotti looks at ways of destabilizing and decentralizing the human subject. So she's kind of, her, her main kind of uh, critique is of humanocentrism, anthropocentrism, and she wants to look at ways of decentralizing that through uh, post-humanism, and in particular critical post-humanism. Another particularly helpful overview of critical posthumanism uh, was written by Pramod K. Nayar, uh, and that's just called Posthumanism. Uh, these are really catchy titles that everyone's doing for their books. Um, and what Nayar says is uh, he's basically picking up on similar kind of strands as what Bredotti is saying, but he's focusing more on the kind of constructed nature of normalcy, of normalness, of norms and norm enforcement that technologies, particularly transhumanist technologies or transhumanist uses of technologies, are continuing to perpetuate. Um, so if, for example, there's, there's uh, sort of discussions, for example, of um, if you are born deaf, for example, uh, and you are offered a cochlear implant or some kind of technology to um, overcome that sort of limitation, that might be a sort of technological form of norm enforcement, whereas in actual fact it is kind of erasing an identity that people might sort of, you know, want to sort of see differently as well. So there's these different types of norm enforcements that are driven through technologies that critical posthumanists are really perceptive to and um, sort of critical of. <laughs> 
Elaine Graham is another key theorist in the field of critical posthumanism. She's um, also a theologian. Um, her book, uh, Represent Representations of the Post Slash Human, um, it's from 2002, so it's slightly more dated now, but it's also really, really uh, helpful for thinking about how we uh, challenge these boundaries. And it's Elaine Graham who coins the term gates of difference, which I find particularly helpful for thinking about transhumanism and posthumanism in particular. What are the gates of difference between the two? I'm also citing Neil Babington here, uh, because uh, Babington's written a really useful essay um, on how Elaine Graham develops the term post slash human, and I keep referring to it because it's quite an important ling linguistic construction. Uh, so Babington's essay, I think it's in the Journal of Theology and Sexuality, uh, it's just called Post Oblique Human, and he talks about why that forward slash is so important uh, for kind of slowing down the processes by which we assume that we are human. He puts the sort of, I mean, Elaine Graham puts the forward slash in there as a sort of slowing down uh, the reflections, thinking about what those two words actually signify and what they might mean. So the post and the human are two really uh, important linguistic aspects of the post-human. I'll come back to that in a second. Stefan Herbrachter is another um, excellent theorist on uh, critical post-humanism. He's more in the sort of literary, literate uh, tradition. Um, but Herbrachter says quite, um, quite a lot of droll phrases in his book, um, and he's He's more kind of cautious, I would say, to some of the limitations of critical posthumanism as well. So one of the phrases that sticks in my mind from his work is that anthropocentrism is stalled as it is installed. So there's this kind of necessary failure of anthropocentrism that is kind of the shadow of trying to impose it at the same time. So um, yeah, he, it, I guess for Herbrechter, the posthuman is that which always uh, accompanies and shadows the human. It's the kind of uh, reflective shadow side of what we're doing, what we're desiring, and what we're, um, how we're relating to the world. I mentioned uh, Nayar's use of critical posthumanism to critique uh, the uh, constructed nature of normalcy. Uh, there's another theorist here that's not strictly associated with critical posthumanism, but I thought it was worth bringing up here. Uh, Dan Goody and his colleagues at the University of Sheffield are involved in a project that uh, develops the concept of the dis slash human. And again, the forward slash is important for slowing down how we're thinking about these terms. But he focuses in particular on disability studies and how posthumanism challenges what it is to be abled and disabled. Um, so it's, it's really kind of getting to the heart of those norms that we're carrying with us into our technologies and encourage us to slow down and reflect on what it is that we're doing with them. So again, similar technologies, so it's the same technologies that are being discussed in effect by posthumanists and transhumanists, but post critical posthumanism encourages more of that um, reflective stance towards them rather than kind of going, um, charging ahead into the uh, sort of narratives of progress with them. So some of the key tensions that we can bring up from post-humanism then, is post-humanism about evolution? Is it about critique? In certain texts like Mary Shelley's um, Frankenstein, for example, we do find elements of both. We find critique and we find the sense of evolution. We find this kind of fear of the uh, created monster be sort of you know, having his own species and being able to reproduce. And that's why uh, Dr. Frankenstein doesn't make his monster a mate. So there's this kind of narrative of evolution and critique that's embedded in these texts. So they, again, just to reiterate, they're not radically separate. They go hand in hand, but it's worth teasing out those kind of distinctions, uh, particularly for how things like the cyborg, which was my own bugbear for the last couple of years, is kind of conflated between transhumanism and critical posthumanism. Linking to this point about evolution and critique, we can have this kind of conversation about whether we're using technologies to extend ourselves, whether that is extending our own physical bodies and our own powers, having a sort of an upgraded limb, an upgraded memory, for example, or also extending our kind of influence in the world. So this is where things like post animals, genetic uh, intervention um, in different species is an extension of our influence and our kind of um, our, our dominion, I guess, or domination of the world. Um, or are the kind of dis dissolutions, so these kind of arresting pauses and thinking about what it actually is to be human in the first place, which comes a lot more along with this kind of point about critique. 
And I think dissolutions is quite an interesting term because um, if you kind of cover the front bit of it, we have this idea of solutions, which is sort of suggesting the teleology of transhumanism there again. So there's a lot of emphasis on language and playing about with um, brackets and forward slashes in critical posthumanism, but it's really important for slowing us down and thinking about what these terms actually mean. There may also, in both critical and evolutionary posthumanism, be a kind of what I've termed here as a reification of alternative boundaries. So although transhumanists might be seeking to overcome the limits of the body, they might be reifying that kind of dualistic boundary. And although critical posthumanism seeks to overcome those boundaries and liberate ourselves from uh, these problematic dualisms, as people like Elaine Graham have noted of Donna Haraway's work, we might leave other boundaries intact. So Elaine Graham says of Haraway, there's a boundary between transcendence and imminence that she leaves very problematic um, in her final kind of um, suggestion of the tension between the cyborg and the goddess. So at the end of Haraway's cyborg manifesto, she says, I would rather be a cyborg than a goddess. And I think Haraway is something really interesting calling our attention to the impacts and the implications of these different uh, boundaries and dualisms. But as Elaine Graham also rightly says, that does suggest another boundary that we might have to think through, uh, and it poses you know, other things for critical posthumanists to be aware of and to think through. So you know, this ideal of liberation is always haunting our aspirations, and it's always kind of lagging behind. So it's that kind of stalling and installing at the same time. So the takeaway message from this part is posthumanism is a complex term. Um, I suppose you could sort of uh, straighten out some definitions by saying rather than posthumanism is the catch all term, we might be looking at posthumanities, posthumanisms, um, something like that to help you out. But um, I'm suggesting it here because, in actual fact, when you're reading a lot of things on posthumanism, there's often conflations between these different types of posthumanist figure. A lot of people, as I say, will talk about the uh, cyborg when they mean the transhuman. A lot of people will talk about the posthuman when they mean specifically the teleology of the transhuman, in actual fact, not talking about the critical posthuman subject. So there are important tensions to be aware of, and I'm sort of keep throwing the term posthumanism out because it is one that often gets used as a shorthand in a lot of uh, the literature out there without actually thinking it through necessarily. Part of this complexity of the notion of posthumanism is that all forms of posthumanism can be continuous or discontinuous with the human. So there are these talks about continuities and ruptures, but in actual fact, that's not something that's, you know, the continu continuities are not just limited to the transhumanist subject that's seeking to emphasize how we're remaining human in the process. Some people who talk about, some people who talk about um, critical posthumanism will emphasize how there is a necessary, that there's a necessary um, anthropocentrism even in the notion of the term posthumanism, which is why Donna Haraway likes to move away from it and talk about how we're hummus instead of human. The language carries those lingering traces of humanism, and this is what um, Hebrechter is really calling our attention to in his critique of critical posthumanism. Part of these tensions in the term posthumanism itself comes from how we can emphasize different parts of it. We can emphasize the human part of the posthuman, which is what you can presume that some transhumanists are doing with their evolutionary sense of the posthuman, or we can talk about the post part of the posthuman, where it's the kind of coming after. The caveat with thinking about the post of posthuman or emphasizing the post, and it is a really important term, is that there are various different implications of it. It can mean coming after, post-dating something, but also in the tradition of Jean-Francois Lyotard, who talks about what postmodernity and postmodernism is, he doesn't say postmodernism is just the coming after of modernity. It's in many ways the extension and continuity and reflexivity of modernity looking back on itself maybe at a hyper-accelerated rate, but there's still this continuity rather than the coming after. So thinking about post in that sense might help us to think more about the human of posthumanism and what we're carrying through with these technologies as well. There's a human stamp that's always on these, um, sort of, um, these ideas, these thoughts, and is that actually something we should be paying attention to as well? The other thing that I'd mentioned about posthumanism as well um, is that it does not have to be exclusively about technology. I've been focusing on technologies primarily in relation to transhumanism because that is what people tend to be focusing on. But I've also gestured towards things like post animals, um, and I suggested how Donna Haraway is calling our attention to our connections with other species, with the rest of the world. Um, 
And this all falls under the rubric of post-humanism as well. In actual fact, in um, Haraway's post-cyborg work, she talks about things called companion species, which is about our uh, fundamental connectivities and relationalities with other species. She uses the example of dogs, um, saying how dogs and humans have co-shaped one another through evolution, through our sort of long history. This is a post-humanist critique, but it's not obviously necessarily strictly about technology. So it's all about those kind of uh, multiplicities of different things, and that's something else to be aware of. I'm going to pause for a second there. Does anyone have any questions on anything that I've talked about so far? I know there's time for questions at the end, but I just want to check that everyone's on board for various parts about post-humanism. There's a little pit stop there. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to suggest some theological reflections now. Now, I'm not going to go into excessive detail on anything. I'm just going to scope out different ways that theology might think about or critically engage with the critical post-humanist figure or with, you know, uh, post-humanism more generally. I'll start off with some of the key themes, key theological themes that are raised by these figures, and I've been gesturing towards them in my um, overview of post-humanisms, um, but I'll call some more explicit attention to them now. Um, there's notions of dominion and stewardship, so what is our place in the world? What should we do? What can and cannot we do with our technologies? These all fall under the kind of questions of dom dominion, domination, stewardship. How much should we be doing in particular with things like um, the post-animal with animals? Um, should we be intervening in different um, DNA sort of sequences? Should we be uh, engaging in these kind of genetic interventions? Or is that something that kind of uh, suggests notions of hubris, for example? So Genesis 1 is really important for those kinds of conversations. And also Lynn White, um, who suggested uh, in the mid-20th century uh, that uh, Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion the world has ever seen. He was calling attention to these points about dominion and stewardship and how it places a strong emphasis on the human that has dominion over the rest of the world. And if we run away with these ideas through technology, which you can see in some forms of transhumanism, it kind of raises these questions again. So what's that fine line between dominion and domination? And how do we figure stewardship in an appropriate way with our technologies? Linking to this point about uh, uh, anthropocentrism, about uh, our own kind of sense of dominion, our own relationship to the rest of the world, we have the question that's also raised of human difference and desire. So human uniqueness, human eliteness, are all kind of corollaries of these notions of human difference and desire that post-humanism calls our attention to through its questioning of what it is to be human. Genesis 2 is a key sort of creation-centered text for thinking about desire, in particular uh, Adam's relationship to the animals and his relationship to Eve and also his relationship to God. Um, these are things that can be carried through in different technological um, sort of um, uses and mythologies as well. Um, but this point about human difference as well and human separateness from the rest of the world links that point about dominion. It's a key question when we're thinking about what it is to be human. Uh, we, we're kind of getting to the assumptions of how we express and perform that humanness as well. Uh, this point about difference in desire also links to notions of creaturely limits. Um, are we to emphasise our creatureliness alongside other species, and in which case we have limits, we have finitude, uh, no matter how much transhumanists might want to deny various parts of those limits, how much should we, respect for the, should we, re, should we be respectful of those, and how much do we emphasise perhaps on a contrary sort of uh, end of the scale um, our um, sort of innate, um, sort of the, the image of God that we bear? How much does that kind of give us an override of some of these creature limits? And these are all important conversations that are had, uh, particularly in theological reflections on technologies. I think these kind of points, particularly about dominion and stewardship, raise wider um, eco-theological concerns about the value and prioritization of life, particularly in the things that I'm reading at the moment about love and robots. There's a key question that keeps coming up about whether if we love robots, that's going to dehumanize us because we're loving something that's, uh, innate, that's inert, that's non-living, and this is going to kind of disenchant our own, um, our own perspective. This is actually going to take, a, take away something that's significant to us about being human, and that's about engaging with uh, the living world. So how we value and prioritise life amidst all these technological interventions and processes is a really key theological question. And it kind of, this uh, point about human nature is kind of suggested by uh, what I, suggest, what I uh, uh, talked about through human difference and desire, uh, but we can also ask what it is to be human in relationship to our own creation. Uh, so this is where Imago Dei is a really key term. 
um, and it's one that I focus on for my own um, research. But also there's looking at the teleological, eschatological visions of human nature, and that's something that, Michael, you looked at in your uh, amazing book um, on uh, transhumanism and uh, teleology. So there's just some broad ways that we can think about um, theology and critical post-humanism. I've pulled up a quote here from Laudato C to kind of express something of the technological, the theological engagement with technologies. Um, if you can't quite read it, I'll just read it through for everyone. The degree of human intervention, often in the service of business interests and consumerism, is actually making our earth less rich and beautiful, ever more limited and grey, even as technological advances and consumer goods continue to abound limitlessly. We seem to think that we can substitute an irreplaceable and irretrievable beauty with something which we have created ourselves. Now, although in other parts of the encyclical, uh, Pope Francis does talk about the benefits that science and technology can bring, I think here is a kind of uh, fairly uh, straightforward uh, dichotomy between nature and technologies. And through the technological worldview that we're perpetuating, which has connotations of business and consumerism, we're actually robbing the world of its kind of liveliness. And it's this kind of grey... Um, great vision of a bleak future that's kind of coming up there. So this is where, again, technologies bring up those questions of eco-theology. Um, but I would suggest as well, in relation to what I said about different forms of post-humanism, uh, when we have the evolutionary post-human that can lead towards technophobia and technophilia, this does suggest, this passage at least, suggests something more on that kind of technophobic, uh, romanticized view of nature that excludes the technological. So, Perhaps the critical post-humanist view would try to nuance this view a little bit further and look at how technologies are already engaging in the world and they're already kind of mediating our own action, not necessarily in ways that are making it more grey. There's a lot more complexity to it than that. And to be fair, the document, the papal encyclical, is a lot more complex than this. It's just a key passage that's worth flagging up to think about technologies. So I'm going to go through some uh, areas that I find interesting for thinking about um, theology and technology, and we can see what you guys make of it and have a discussion about it afterwards. Um, one of the things that I focused on, in, again, in my own research on theological anthropology and the cyborg is the notion of Imago Dei. Um, and Mark Cortez talks about three, at least three dominant interpretations of Imago Dei. And these basically give us a sense or an indicator of how we think about what it is to be human in theological terms. And my whole argument in my thesis is that even if we're in a secular culture, these theological ideas about what it is to be human are still impactful and still really important. They still manifest in different parts of popular culture. And I'm happy to come back to that afterwards. But I'll just give a whistle-stop tour of these different interpretations of Imago Dei. One of them is the substantive view. And the substantive view emphasizes that there is something abstract, something innate to humans that makes us who we are. So a substantive view of Imago Dei would, for example, say that because God breathed the breath of life into Adam in Genesis 2, that's something that we have inherently. That's something that makes us human. That's something that is constitutive of who we are that perhaps defines us against the other animals. So there is something inherently and distinctly and abstractly human. And we can talk about this. This has been figured in terms of rationality, language, consciousness, various different things over um, history and different um, philosophies. But we can link it um, at least to, in theological language to a substantive view of Imago Dei. There's also a functional account of what it is to be human. And the functional account emphasizes more so Genesis 126, uh, which uh, is talking about our role as stewards, our dominion uh, towards the rest of, the, of, the, of creation. Uh, this account of Imago Dei says that to be human is to be stewardly, to have dominion. So it's something that we enact and perform in an active way. It's not something that we have by virtue of being human. It's something that we have to live out in our actions um, and our, our kind of engagements with the world. So it's similar to a, a substantive view, but it's, there's a sort of important difference there as well. The other one that Cortez points out is a relational interpretation. And relational, the clue is in the title, it's all about our relationships that we have with other species and with each other, and even, uh, we might say, with our technologies as well. Being human isn't something located in any one of us. It's all about in our connections, and that's not just with other humans. So being human is all about thinking about how we are 
uh, co-constituted by other animals. So going back to Haraway's um, companion species, how we've co-formed dogs and dogs have co-shaped to us, as well as other species. It's being aware of those complexities that make up who we are in ways that aren't, we can't abstract ourselves from everything else when we think about what it is to be human. Whereas with a substantive account, you can talk about humanness in abstraction from everything else. So there's the kind of key differences between those three. Mark Cortez also talks about a fourth interpretation, which is basically a multifaceted approach, a combination of those three. In my own book, I've suggested um, a fourth approach that builds on some of the capacities of this relational approach, but emphasizes more so elements of hybridity. Hybridity is something that's kind of important when we're thinking about cyborgs, because cyborgs their name literally means cybernetic organism, so it's a coming together of the machinic and the organic. Um, and in my book, I talked about how we can figure that as fusions, so a simple coming together, A plus B equals C. But with those fusions, you still have the separate original parts that you can abstract and think about as separate. With a sort of cyborg hybridity, you can't abstract those separate parts. So I think when I was writing my thesis, I was having a particularly hungry moment where I uh, use an analogy of having um, chocolate chips in a cake batter and cocoa powder in a cake batter. If you've got chocolate chips, you can kind of pick them out. That's the sort of fusions, and that's the not necessarily coming together in any deep, meaningful ways. You can still separate it. Um, or the cocoa powder is where it's deeply infused into the mixture. And that's more about what I've termed confusions rather than fusions. It's kind of deep hybridity that we can't abstract or remove ourselves from. Um, so that's a radical critique, um, uh, what I've proposed is a radical critique of the substantive account, and it takes up uh, ideas from the cyborg to construct that. But it does have a lot of resonances with the relational approach. It's still saying that we have to think about who we are in our relationships. It's just that they're deeply embedded and constitutive of who we are. So when I'm talking about this um, hybrid approach to Imago Dei, uh, I'm emphasizing key terms like implosions, fabulation, and histories. They're kind of big, scary terms that I've talked a lot about in the book. Uh, but what I'm basically talking about is the need to think about things coming together in interesting and fundamentally confusing ways. And that's part of our ontology, and that's part of our life that we have to kind of get on board with. Why I've kind of picked these um, points about Imago Dei up, and this, they're, they're important for thinking about what it is to be human, which obviously links to points in critical post-humanism, but it also links to developments in AI and artificial intelligence. And Noreen Hertzfeld is a, uh, an excellent uh, scholar. She's uh, both a computer scientist and a theologian. And she's written a book, um, In Our Image, Computers and the Human Spirit. And she talks about how these three uh, interpretations of Imago Dei have paralleled developments in AI. So we, start, we started off with early visions of the kind of AI summer. We had grand hopes of making a machine that could think like a human that could basically be an artificial general intelligence that mimics this kind of substantive view, programming rationality into a machine. Scientists could quickly realize that wasn't possible. Uh, so they scale back those assumptions and those kind of ideas into what's called the AI winter, and Hertzfeld links that to the functional interpretation of Imago Dei because it's more about what these limited machines can actually do. So it can be amazing at playing chess, for example. You can have a um, robot that's really good at cleaning your floors, but they couldn't do each other's job. So it's all about defining that robot through its function, and that's a different view of AI that kind of uh, replaced a sort of more substantive uh, approach. And then Hertzfeld finally talks about relational uh, models of robots. There's a recent trend towards social robots, uh, robots that learn through relationships and through interactions with others. So if you want to find some example of these, there's one called iCub. Uh, that's developed by researchers, I think, in Italy. Uh, iCub looks like a sort of robotic toddler. Um, and uh, I went to a demonstration with iCub in University of Shef Sheffield a couple of years ago. Uh, and the researcher basically asked iCub to uh, pick up a ball in front of it and just hold it. Pretty unremarkable, but that robot was not programmed to do any of those things. What the robot had to do was learn how to identify the ball in front of it, how to reach out and grab it, how to apply just enough pressure to grab the ball and not drop it, and to pick it up as well. So this is a kind of relational approach to, uh, to robotics. It's this social robotic model of learning uh, and developing through interaction with others, because that's how human children learn. So now we're, we're modeling robots on that kind of psychological development theory. So Hertzfeld has a short article in Zygon, 
uh, that summarizes some of the broad uh, claims that she's making in her book in our image. Uh, and I've just pulled a quote from this, and she says that one, of, one goal of AI is to create an other in our own image. That image will necessarily be partial, thus we must determine what it is in ourselves that computers must possess or demonstrate to be considered our mind children. And mind children is the phrase that Hans Moravec came up with. So Moravec was the guy who talked about the robot surgery and uploading yourself <laughs> to cyberspace. The question of what we humans might share with such an other has been examined by Christian theologians through the concept of the image of God, in which, according to Genesis 1, human beings were created. Is this image that humans share with God related to the image we wish to share with our own creation in AI? And this question is kind of what I'm proposing as a sort of interesting theological question that responds both to developments on a more kind of developmental, uh, evolutionary post-humanist uh, kind of imagining of things, so developing new robots, but also to that critical post-humanist question, what is it to be human? So what's the connection between humans and robots? We're making robots that look like us, that do similar things to us, that engage with the world like us. What does that say about how we uh, see ourselves through these robots and are we reflecting the image of God through these technological relationships as well? So I think that's perhaps one of the most important questions, at least uh, from my kind of perspective on theological anthropology, one of the most important questions that we can ask in relation to critical post-humanism in uh, theological anthropology. We can expand on that question as well. So we've got the idea of the image of God. We might ask about the image of the human that we're building into these machines. And that's not just literally in the, in the uh, form of humanoid robots, robots that look like cute kind of toddlers, but also robots that have our image in different, more abstract ways as well. So Imago Hominis is the idea uh, of machines in our image, and we can ask whether technologies, as well as us making technologies in our image, are technologies also making others in our image? So this goes back to the point about the post-animal, for example. If we're using technologies to intervene in genetic uh, kind of uh, com compositions, are we imposing our image onto the rest of the wider world through our technologies? And is that, is that a responsible outworking of what it is to be human through our machines? The imago hominis can be more literal. Um, we can enter uncanny valley with uh, uh, Masahiro Mori's theory of 1970. So uh, this image on the right is of uh, uh, Ishiguru um, and his robot doppelganger. Ishiguru is a famous Japanese roboticist and he's really interested in thinking about Uncanny Valley and thinking about ways that we might want to push beyond it. Uncanny Valley, for anyone who's not familiar with it, is the idea that over, uh, at, with, with kind of increasing likeness that robots have to humans, the more comfortable we are with them, the more kind of open to social, relational encounters we are with robots, up to a point where it looks almost human-like, but not quite fully there. And there's something that gives the game away, and it gives us a kind of jarring sense of unease. And our comfort levels drop right down into this kind of valley-like uh, vision on a graph. I haven't got, I don't want to put it on the board or anything, but um, it's, it's, if you imagine like a kind of slowly going up curve that just sort of drops off at a point, that's human uh, likeness and our kind of comfort levels with what we're interacting with with these machines. You might ask them, why are people like Ishiguru? If we've got this kind of point about Uncanny Valley, why is he trying to make robots that look like himself and that are quite sort of uh, disarming to people engaging with them? Um, Ishiguru actually has a four-year-old daughter, um, and he made a robot doppelganger of her and didn't tell her about this. So he let her run into a room and meet her robot clone, and she very quickly experienced what Uncanny Valley is like. Um, so you might ask, why is Ishiguru doing this? Um, and actually, the answer is he's really interested in Uncanny Valley because he's interested in what might come after it. And this is a very speculative, hypothetical theory, because we haven't got anywhere near it yet, um, that if you have robots that are so human-like that you can't tell the difference, that our comfort levels are going to go right back up, and it's going to be as if interacting with a human. And this is, again, the stuff of sci-fi, um, Blade Runner, the sort of replicants in there. You can't tell the difference between those and humans, and you have to use a Voigt-Kampf test based on empathy and emotionality to give the game away instead of appearance. So, you know, there's this idea that we can transcend Uncanny Valley and have um, complete comfort with the machine. And I think this also taps into what I was saying about um, uh, romanticism and machines as well. It's this idea of a technophilia where the machine disappears 
It becomes so concealed behind the sort of human outer kind of layer that we don't actually care if it's a machine or not. We don't realize if it's a machine or not. Uh, and this is the kind of romanticist hypothesis behind a lot of our technophilic ideas. The sort of critical posthumanist take on that, I guess, if that's the sort of evolutionary take, the critical take is, well, what can we say about um, our own image in the process? What's so important about machines that have a human face, that have a human voice, that look like us? Why are these things so important? So that might be a more critical question that we can ask of these evolutionary trends. Social robotics, I've already sort of talked about. This is another example of a social robot. This is another two examples of social robot. Uh, this is called NAO, N-A-O. And they're quite small, cutesy robots that are designed for children to interact with. Um, they're kind of doing popular, they're, they're very popular in schools, although the first time I encountered NOW was at a, um, a Swiss robotics convention uh, about 10 years ago. And the, uh, these robots were playing a sort of game of football and they were out in the crowd and you could see all the parents pushing their young children towards these robots, like, go and play, go and play. And these children running away, they were absolutely terrified of them. So, you know, even in the last couple of years, we've come a long way because children are very open to interacting uh, and having meaningful encounters with these robots. Um, Cynthia Brazil, who, is, who was um, a robotics researcher at MIT, um, is often credited with kind of the spark or the kind of big uh, trend towards these social robotics. Um, so Brazil's book from 2002 is Designing Sociable Robots. Sorry, Designing Social Robots. And she talks about why it's important to have these relational social emphases in our robots and why that's kind of um, what she sees as the, the sort of future of robotics, particularly consumer robotics. Social robotics, though, or sort of social uh, understandings of AI don't always have this kind of cutesy, cutesy, nice side. Uh, there's also the case of Tay, if anyone's heard of Tay from Microsoft Twitter. Uh, Tay uh, was an algorithm that was designed to learn from her, her interactions with other users on Twitter. Uh, Microsoft designed Tay as a sort of PR stunt. Uh, within less than 16 hours, Tay learned from the trolls of cyberspace how to be homophobic, racist, misogynistic, uh, anti-Semitic, you name it, everything. Tay was uh, spatting out all of these kind of things. So um, when we're thinking about social robots and how robots and machines might bear our image, we also have to think about the sort of other side of our image as well. We're not kind of angels. We have these other um, aspects to ourselves as well, particularly in cyberspace. Um, so this is um, something that I've been working on for a piece of research at the moment uh, in the editor collection I mentioned earlier on, what's happening in cyberspace with our kind of relationships and how does the image of the human communicate to artificial intelligences um, and other kind of technologies. So there's a kind of, again, a critical posthumanist question that comes into that. So this image here is of um, Cynthia Brazil. Uh, she's the one on the right. Um, she's interacting here with her robot Kismet, and this is one of her social robots that she pioneered at MIT. Uh, so it's quite old now, this is uh, from 2002. Um, Kismet, you can see, is definitely a robot. Um, but what's interesting about Kismet is that people who interacted with it uh, found, or the researchers observing these people, found that they suspended disbelief that this was just a robot. They found themselves uh, projecting emotions, intentions, uh, meaningfulness onto their encounter with Kismet. And then when people walk away afterwards, they kind of think, that was a robot, what have I done? And they have this kind of pushback against those kind of sentiments. Um, and for, I'm mentioning this because Anne First, who is a theologian, uh, was actually a theologian in residence doing a postdoctoral project in MIT uh, alongside um, Cynthia Brazil's team. And Anne First wrote about these uh, experiences in her book, God in the Machine. Um, and she kind of links these kind of um, these encounters to theological ideas. So one of the um, ideas that she has about this is that she always likes to think that robots will be our future partner species. In a way, when you look at humans, we are so desperately lonely. We look desperately for animal intelligence by trying to communicate with chimps and dolphins. And at the same time, we look for extraterrestrial intelligence. So in a way, we are a very lonely species. And for me as a theologian, that is because we lost our relationship with God that was started at the beginning. So it makes sense that we would try to build a species that would be our partners and friends. What I think is suggested here is this kind of going back to the sort of technophobia, technophilia distinction. This is kind of going to the more technophilia side of things. And it's got sort of theological justification and um, underpinnings to it, theological foundations. So again, this isn't really necessarily critical posthumanism, but what First also does in her book is think about 
personhood in the context of these engagements with machines. Uh, and she looks deeper at our kind of image, how that's kind of carried across in these sorts of relationships. So if, for example, in Margot Day, we are to say it is relational, is that something we can find in relationships with things like kismet, or is it only in relationships with other animals, with nature, however we want to figure it? These are questions that I think are important for theological anthropology. The insidious side of all of these things, so I've suggested about Tay uh, and the dangers of having machines that take on our image. There's also the danger uh, that a lot of sci-fi and a lot of people are talking about, which is the danger of us ourselves as humans remaking ourselves into the image of the machine. So I've suggested Imago Machinae for this. Um, the image I've taken to express this is Metropolis, uh, a 1920s uh, German film by, directed by Fritz Lang. It's black and white, it's silent, uh, but it's a fantastic film. It's freely available on the internet, I think, and it's got a lot of material for theological engagement with technologies. There's a lot of uh, references to, uh, to scripture, to church, to theological ideas, um, and how uh, sort of theological ideas sort of, um, mediate our um, understandings of technology as well. So, the question is, it's not literally are we making ourselves into machines, or it might be one part of it. It's also, do we make ourselves less human by ordering ourselves to technocratic systems and attitudes? So it's the sort of broader philosophy of technology. Um, Jacques Ellul is a key theorist on this. He takes up the sort of Heideggerian tradition, um, and he looks at how technologies are ordered to something called technique. And technique is this kind of technocratic system that we risk ordering ourselves to through our engagements with technology. So it's that kind of business consumerist ideology that Pope Francis was referring to. So as well as that kind of technocratic ordering, there's also the literal cyborgization of the human, and that's where we get these kind of ideas of the cyborg that might suggest something a bit more transhuman because it's a physical enhancement that we're trying to make to ourselves. Um, so that's one way we can think about the image of the machine. Um, but there's also the um, ways that we're ordering ourselves to different systems and attitudes, technocratic systems. And there's also um, the algorithms that we're maybe unconsciously remaking ourselves or ordering ourselves according to. So algorithms are already shaping our communication in quite profound ways. Um, there's a kind of the black box hypothesis that we're not strictly aware of all the kind of impacts that algorithms and AI technologies are already having on our world. So uh, the Facebook controversy and data privacy is one sort of well uh, cited example, but there's also um, issues that have been talked about with banking algorithms and um, algorithms used in the, particularly the American judicial system that are discriminating on racial and gender uh, bases based on sort of biased input data that these algorithms are receiving. So in a sense, the machine, these algorithms are being made according to the image of the human, which isn't necessarily a great image. Uh, and we're not realizing these biases and they're kind of being reflected back upon us and people are being um, impacted by these algorithms in very real and serious ways. So in a sense there, you might say there's a kind of image of the machine that's imposing itself onto society there. And it's just a diffracted uh, vision of the image of the human there. So this is maybe where some of the controversy and some of the uh, concern about technologies might be. So I'm just going to sort of wrap up some of these points. Uh, I've lost track of time, so I'm sorry if I've been talking a bit too much or anything. Um, so I'm going to sort of link some of these points back to the post-human. So we've looked at different ways we might think of the image of God, the image of the human, and the image of the machine. The image of the post-human, especially the critical post-humanism, uh, the, the critical post-human, I think needs to kind of really go deeper uh, than some of these technophilic and technophobic ideas. Post-humanism, to, re to reiterate, is a kind of critique of or resistance to abstract or substantive notions of humanness and technology. So it's saying that um, we can't start with the assumption that we know what it is to be human and then assume that we can make machines or we can have machines that are going to jeopardize that in some way. It's saying that if that is the final, th uh, if that is what we deduce from you know, critical examination of how we interact with technologies, so be it, but we can't make that assumption as the prior point. And that's the dangerous thing that posthumanism calls our attention to. Critical posthumanism is wary both of technophobia and technophilia, which I've sort of suggested might be two sides of the same coin. When we have this abstract point in the first place, we can either have something that will benefit and enhance that, or we can have something that will jeopardize it. And this is you know, where the two sides of the same coin argument comes from. If we actually sort of deconstruct 
what that abstract thing is in the first place and we look at how you know, to be human is actually to be in relationship rather than to be something unique or you know, isolatable in any kind of abstract way, then actually you know, technologies aren't going to be as technophobic or as technophilic. They, how we use them, how we think about them, has got to be a lot more nuanced along with how we think about what it is to be human. And that's where we can maybe focus on some more of the ethical things about things like banking algorithms, um, algorithms in the judicial system that are having more concrete um, impacts. Um, critical posthumanism, again, uh, there, there are sort of it is very similar to some more evolutionary forms of the posthuman, but it also, I think what's spe specific to critical posthumanism is that it emphasizes ongoing and active construction and deconstruction of the human through relationships. So again, relationships, relationalities are absolutely key. And whereas with, uh, certainly with ideas about the transhuman, if we're gonna have this idea that Huxley talked about with man remaining man, but realizing more possibilities of and for human nature, we already have that assumption of what it is to be human or what it is to be man in the first place. With critical posthumanism, we realize that actually we're remaking ourselves as human in ongoing um, and very active ways. So we can't start off again with those assumptions. We have to look at how we're continually constructing. And also part of that, you know, looking at how we're constructing is deconstructing uh, those assumptions about what it is to be human. So it's a very um, ongoing um, an active dialogue rather than anything static or assumptive. So critical posthumanism in that sense, because it is ongoing and because it is kind of this open uh, relational perspective, it's not fatalistic or totalistic. It's not looking to a specific teleology where we're going to become posthuman. It's not saying we're already posthuman. It's not saying we're already transhuman or anything like that. It's basically saying that what it is to be human, what it is to be cyborg, however we want to label it, is open um, and it's basically constituted by whatever we're doing and however we're reflecting on it. It's often assumed that when we're talking about critical posthumanism, and when I go to um, beyond humanism, posthumanist conferences, uh, there's often not a lot of theological kind of representation there. This year it's a lot different, there's a lot more kind of theological voices. But I think there's an often an assumption with discussions about uh, posthumanism that it's kind of somehow excluding a theological insights, and that's absolutely not so the case. Um, I think there's really important contributions that theology, theological anthropology can make to our understandings of the critical posthuman. At the same time, theology can learn from critical posthumanism and think about um, assumptions about what it is to be human, think about how it applies to uh, eco-theology, for example. So I want to say that the critical posthuman, another boundary that's overcoming is it's not excluding a theological or secular insights. It's bringing all these things together and taking account of these different perspectives. And I see it as therefore an invitation to develop a nuanced and multifaceted critique. And this is part of the excitement of critical posthumanism because it is um, active, it is ongoing, it's never really completed. It's also the kind of daunting thing about critical posthumanism because it, it is just kind of infinite and it's never ending. But um, that's kind of the point of it. If, it. if it had an ending point, if we kind of fundamentally succeed in deconstructing the human, what then? What does that mean? So critical posthumanism is kind of uh, it, it realizes the need for that ongoing and sustained critique. So final theological reflections, if it's gonna load. Okay, final theological reflections then. Can we be in the image of machines at the same time that we're in the image of God? So think about how these images kind of translate across different relationships. Do we make machines in the image of God? Are any other non-humans in the image of God? And this is part of that kind of interspecies dialogue there. Think about our relationships and how they carry across, not only through technologies, but also with other forms of the non-human. And how do these points relate to notions of creatureliness? So creatureliness is an important theological idea. Can critical posthumanism re and invoke a sense of that creatureliness? I think uh, one of the effective things that critical posthumanism does, particularly in response to transhumanism, is call attention to our kind of own humility, uh, making us aware of certain hubristic ideas that transhumanists might kind of 
run away with the idea of kind of, you know, uh, as the extreme example, wanting to uh, upload ourselves to cyberspace or wanting to overcome uh, the disease of aging, as Aubrey de Grey talks about. So there's clear denials of certain parts of, hum of creatureliness and of limits there. So I think critical posthumanism can be sort of a way of thinking about those in an interesting uh, sort of fashion. This is my book, um, where I've taken sort of a lot of these ideas from. Um, the image on the front, um, if anyone can tell what it is, it's uh, actually a sort of leg from the Terminator, uh, from the sort of Terminator exoskeleton. So that's the sort of hinge joint. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's the book that um, came out of my PhD research. And I just thought I'll close by giving the sort of eight suggestions that I've proposed in the book that a cyborg theology should do. Uh, which I think kind of summarises the kind of points that I've been saying about critical posthumanism, hopefully, here today. So I think the cyborg theology should take account of context. It's contextually embedded, it's not abstract, uh, which involves an awareness of multiple actors that interconnect in, this is the sort of confusions uh, in confusing ways. So again, it's not isolating anything, it's emphasising this relationality all the way down. Uh, cyborg theology should also be attentive to the narratives and histories and stories that shape our understanding. So it's very, again, rooted in its context. Uh, advocating a decentered approach. So it's not prioritizing any one subject, any one kind of you know, human uh, idea particularly, or also any one um, discipline. Um, challenge uh, prior notions of discreteness and taxonomy. So these um, taxonomies that we use to make sense of the world might be useful to a point, but I think when we reify them too much, we get into all kinds of different uh, problems, particularly in the way of dom dom uh, figuring dominion as domination. Uh, num point number five, uh, what I was saying just now about posthumanism, critical posthumanism being this kind of um, ongoing process, its work is never resolved or complete. I think as soon as you've got the final word on it, you've kind of moved away from critical posthumanism and done something more evolutionary or teleological in a sense. Uh, that's not to say you can't make any you know, deeper, meaningful insights, but I think it's just something we always have to kind of keep going back to. Um, it should uh, maintain its critical and reflective enterprise to always challenge assumptions. So again, starting with our experience rather than abstract notions of what it is or isn't to be human. Um, avoid excluding groups or notions such as technology. So um, particularly in my work, I looked at how Eden uh, encourage the, the sort of construction of Eden as a mythology encourages to think about romantic ideas about technology as separate from the rest of the world. I think that a cyborg theology should avoid these kinds of separations and see these kind of relationships that technology have with the natural world, with humans, with animals, etc. Uh, and finally, emphasize that our relationality with all identities and histories is immersive, interactive, and participatory. So, this is everyone is involved in this kind of enterprise. We cannot totally transcend the connections that dynamically constitute us and others. Instead, we must tether practices of fabulation to the world in order to refigure transcendence and imminence in non-innocent and imploded ways. So again, it's this kind of rethinking about what it is to be transcendent and imminent um, in, in light of technological um, changes and claims.